Whoa. Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. I'm Pastor Craig Dabinsky and we are at Enola Church of God in Enola, Pennsylvania. I'm glad that you decided to join us tonight on Facebook Live and also on Sunshine TV on YouTube. I'm looking out across this room and I see eager Bible students got their Bibles open to John chapter 1 already and they're ready to go. I have passed out a sheet tonight called World Religions Contrary to Christianity, Islam. Now, I want to explain where this comes from and why I'm doing this. One week ago tonight, I returned from Israel with ten other brothers and sisters in Christ from our church, and we were there for a ten-day tour. Uh, this is my third tour of the Holy Land. Uh, the first time I did Israel and Egypt, the second time I did Israel and Jordan, and this time I did just Israel. We uh, went from the Golan Heights in the far north as far as south as the Judean Desert and the Qumran Caves and the Dead Sea. And so we were top to bottom and in two hotels, one in Tiberias on the coast, on the Mediterranean Sea, and the other in the Royal, King David Royal Hotel in Jerusalem. Hence, that's why I'm wearing this t-shirt, Jerusalem. Pam also has one on. Does yours also say Jerusalem? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's where they came from. Um, I was greatly blessed and terribly disappointed simultaneously. Talk about a mixed bag. I was greatly blessed because I was in the Holy Land. And I love Jerusalem. You know, the Bible teaches that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I have a treat for you. In two weeks, I'm going to photocopy and bring you a prayer calendar on how to pray for Jerusalem that I picked up. And it is phenomenal. I love it. And you'll get that in two weeks. We're not talking about Israel tonight, uh, but we will be um, in a little bit. So I was greatly blessed because I got a chance to get on a boat and go across the Sea of Galilee. Now, this is only the third time I've done it, but every time I do it, it's like the first time because it's so beautiful. It's so meaningful. It's so significant. It's so purposeful. Because my Savior and my Lord was there. We traced the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Some of us, not me, uh, some of us uh, walked the Via Dolorosa. Do you know, anybody know what the Via Dolorosa is? Pam knows. What is it? It's a um, path um, going to the cross. Path going to the cross, okay. It literally translates into what? Does anybody know what the literal translation is? Way of suffering, I believe. Way of suffering or way of sorrows. That's exactly right. There are 16 stations. <laughs> stations mean stops along the way. And I did say that some of us walked it, but I didn't. You're probably thinking, gee whiz, you went to the Holy Land, you didn't walk the Via Della Rosa? No, I did not. I rode the Via Della Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long is it? How long is it? Uh, give me a sec. A quarter mile? Oh, no. More than that. More than that. Is that the six mile walk? No, no. That's, that's the city of David. That's the southern part. It's about, I have to look it up, but I'm going to do a guesstimate of one to two miles. Because it's a windy road, it's uphill, it's downhill, it's around the bend, and, you know, it, it meanders through uh, the, the old city, and there are churches all along the way. The Catholic Church has put uh, many, many, many churches in the Holy Land. I mean, they really have a lot. And they're not the only ones. The Greek Orthodox Church has some churches. Um, and a little later when we talk about Jerusalem, I'll tell you a little more. 
But anyway, back to what I'm saying. I was greatly blessed. Uh, oh, I said I rode to Via Della Rosa. What happened is, uh, before I left, I was having difficulty with my back. I'm in PT for my back. I've been having trouble with my knees for about six months, and they're getting worse. I was at Fredrickson Center this morning, and I had x-rays of both knees, and I just had a real tough time with some of the walking. So I didn't do everything. So um, Sharon Stevens and her daughter, Jennifer, who is a special needs young lady, who are good friends of Daphne McConnell, and uh, Jennifer goes to the Special Olympics with Tim, uh, they were with us. And so Sharon and Jennifer and I, we rented a golf cart. And we drove the Via Della Rosa. So we went by our group and we waved to them and we waved back, you know, and they're trucking along, you know, like troopers. Uh, some of the longest walks, they, they did one tour, which was a walking tour of the city of David. The city of David is the southernmost point in Jerusalem. In the city, in the city of Jerusalem. In the city of Jerusalem. And, um, that was a six-mile walk. I couldn't do that. I'd be lucky if I did a half a mile, much less six miles. But there were some in our group who did. I didn't do that. So there were some things I didn't do, but there were some uh, people that did everything. And, uh, you know, that, that was really good. So anyway, the great blessing was being in the Holy Land. The great disappointment is I was amidst a sea of people and I was in a universe of unbelief. A universe of unbelief. Why do I say that? Two reasons. Look at John, chapter 1. The true light, verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Hallelujah. There's Jesus. The light of the world is Jesus. Verse 10. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Isn't that amazing? How can that be? How could they have missed it? Verse 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the Jews. And you know what? Here's the disappointment. The Jewish people, particularly the Orthodox Jewish people, are a very devout, serious group of people. I have pictures, which I haven't put anything on Facebook. I think I put two pictures on so far, because I haven't gotten that far yet. But I was standing at the Western Wall, and adjacent to the Western Wall is a synagogue that's open to the public, and it's an underground synagogue. And I have pictures of all this. And these Jews in there are wearing phylacteries. I've talked about that before. Those are the little boxes on the forehead. And uh, they have the scrolls, miniature, of the Word of God written on them. They have phylacteries on their wrists uh, with leather straps going all the way up where they're wearing the Word of God on their forehead and their hand. These are devout people. These are not... Cavalier, you know, what What does it matter, you know, whatever will be, will be. That is not Orthodox Judaism. They are devout people. Unfortunately, according to John 1, 10, and 11, they missed it. I'm talking to an Orthodox Jewish person right now, uh, in depth with this person, and I asked this person, um, what's next in your faith? What's next? She said, we're waiting for the Messiah to come. And that is so sad because they missed Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, most indeed, is the Messiah. You say, well, you're a Gentile, and that's a Gentile opinion. Is it? Jews for Jesus are Messianic Jews. These are Jewish people who are born of Jewish mothers and Jewish fathers, but they have accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Because they got it, they caught it, they seen it, and they found the Messiah. But the majority of Israel is still waiting for the Messiah. That's, there's two reasons why I was so disappointed. That's one. But I'm not talking about that tonight. I'm talking about...
about this sheep. This is the other reason, and this is called Islam. Now, I have a couple of books up here, and I need to introduce these books to you. Um, I have spoken previously from the Quran, and um, I got a brand new copy, and I'm holding this up to the camera. And you want to pay attention to this. This is real important. Look up here. Pay attention to this. I have never seen anything like this in my life. This is one of a kind, and you're going to know why in just a second. Uh, this is called, it's also on your sheet, the Clear Quran Series, the Thematic English Translation, 2016. Now, this I got free of charge. The price is $14.95. It's on the back here. But I got it free of charge. And the reason why this is so unique, the reason why this is so different than the other Quran I have is, oh, you see all these little yellow tabs on here, folks, mm -hmm. at home? See them? See all them yellow tabs? That's every chapter. There's 114 chapters. I spent three days reading through this and I'm watching every chapter. Okay? But what makes this one unique? All of us know what a study Bible is, right? This is a study Quran. Look at that, Pastor Jensen. Look at the, sorry, look at the footnotes down the bottom of that. Have you ever seen anything like that? No, not no. I've not so seen a Quran. So there like is a little over 6,200 verses, 114 chapters, and all the Qurans I've ever read are just straight, you know, 114 chapters. This one has almost 1,400 study notes that explain the Quran text according to the Muslim faith. Thank you. And I'm going to. Uh, have this up here for any of you that want to take a peek at it a little later when I'm done. And I'm going to be reading from it, quoting from it in a little bit. But I got another book here, and I've showed this book before, holding it up for the camera. I dared to call him father. Okay? And this is a book for everyone who faces change in his life and wonders how best to meet it. This is the incredible journey of discovery of a Muslim woman who opened her Bible and was born again. She also spoke at the Billy Graham Crusade in Singapore. She was invited to share her faith as a converted Muslim. So Muslim evangelism is a real thing, and uh, Muslims are coming to the Lord, and that's an example of, right. of one. And this last book I have is called A Case for Christ, and this is by Lee Strobel. It's an old book, it's not a new one, but um, I just recently got another copy of it. I had it years ago, and uh, he talks about examining the record, analyzing Jesus, researching the resurrection, and the verdict of history is the conclusion. It's never wrong to ask a question, but it's pure foolishness not to seek an answer. This is a man who was an atheist who sought out to find out, is Christianity real real, and is it what it's really cracked up to be? And he found out and learned that it was and became a believer and he wrote this book. He is a Yale law expert. He has a degree from Yale in law. And he wrote this book from a legal perspective showing case in point, case study, how that Christianity is true. And so... I'm going to reference that a little later. Now, I've tried to make this easy for you. I spent three days off and on reading through this Quran, and I've, I've learned a lot. And what I'm doing for you tonight is I'm giving you five questions that I'm going to pose and that I'm going to answer. And I'm going to answer them according to the Quran, and then we're going to go to the Bible, and you're going to see what God has to say. That's what I want to do. Okay? So, first question, what is Islam and the Quran? And by the way, you'll see A all the way through here. That's not an outline, A, B, C. A means answer. So I'm posing the question and I'm giving the answer. And I'm going to go through this a little at a time, and I will take questions as we go through. What is Islam and the Quran? The message of Islam was always the same. Have faith in one God and strive to be a good person. 
Notice that's a quote, and notice it says page XV. Do you know what XV is? Roman numeral. Roman numeral 15. 15. And what that means is that's the introduction to this book. And this book has a very lengthy, very lengthy introduction. And it's really good. I mean, it's, this book is really uh, put together really well. And um, what I did is I marked all of the answers. And if you have a question about any of them, I can show you what it says. They even have a map here of uh, Arabia at the area of the 7th century uh, AD, which is which is relevant. You'll see how that works in a minute. Okay, so the answers are right out of the book. Okay, the Quran, and notice I have the word K-O-R-A-N. That is a correct spelling. It's either or. Quote, was revealed to the prophet Muhammad in the 7th century and was not translated into English by a Muslim until the 20th century. Notice this page, what? Six. Six, good. You know your Roman numerals, very good. And that's exactly what it says, okay? I didn't know that. I, I was a little surprised about that. So it went untranslated into English for all those centuries. It was in Arabic, obviously, but it wasn't in English. Yes, sir? Well, it says here by a Muslim, were there non-Muslim um, people that did translations prior to that, or no? Nobody? I don't know. Oh, I don't interesting. Know. I doubt it. I only doubt it because unless they were fluent in Arabic. You have to be fluent in Arabic because it was written in Arabic. By the way, I'm going to tell you something that surprised me. Now, catch this. This is not the Quran. Did you hear me? This is not the Quran. This is a translation of the Quran. So why do I say that? Because they say in the introduction that the Quran is written in Arabic and you cannot fully appreciate, understand, and assimilate the Quran unless you study Arabic and you read it in its original tongue. Now, aren't you glad we didn't say that about the New Testament? Because you'd all have to learn Greek. Or the Old Testament, you'd all have to learn Hebrew, right? So we're kind of fortunate because we have the whole Bible in English, and it was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, Daniel, some parts of Daniel, and Greek, but we have it in English. And that's the challenge of Bible translation. And I don't want to get off on Bible translations too much, except to say challenge, uh, the challenge of translating three languages into English is a pretty big, tall order. Not an easy job. You really have to know your stuff. And even the experts don't always agree exactly. That's why you have a few variations in some of the translations. And you have the King James Version, you have the ESV, you have the NIV, and you have all these different translations. And um, it's not a question of these two are right and these three are wrong. It's not that simplistic. That's an over simplification. And if you don't believe me, go to school for Hebrew, go to school for Greek, go to school for Aramaic, and then you translate it in English and let's see how well you do. Because I can't do all that. Oh my word. Okay? I did study Hebrew in seminary. I did study Greek. But I'm not an expert. And these people who do this translation eat, drink, dream, live, walk, and uh, pray in the foreign languages. They've got to, because it's got to be, you know, the, their bread and butter, their heart and soul, in order to catch the nuances in language. And not all language translates real well into other languages. And um, I, I saw that humorously by a commercial. This man was in France, and he saw this very pretty, lovely lady, and he thought he practices French, and he goes up to her and he says something, and she smacks him in the face, and down the bottom it says, your face, it looks like a dog. That's not the word he meant. He was trying to say her face 
looks like a dial or is beautiful, but he used the wrong word. He got smacked for it. I thought that was so funny. But that is a problem with language. And just so you know, I've also had three years of French in high school. So I got French, Hebrew, Greek, and English. And um, it's a language is a it, it's something to deal with. It's it's not as easy as it appears to be. Some people say, "Oh, I'm I know English. I know English well." Yeah. So how many dangling modifiers do you have in your vocabulary? <laughs> My English teacher nailed me on that. She said, "You have dangling modifiers." I said, what's a modifier? <laughs> Much less a dangling modifier. <laughs> Some of you that are real good in English might know what I'm talking about, but I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm just telling you what she said. Okay, so anyway, continuing, uh, it was, quote, revealed over a period of 23 years, unquote, and, quote, <laughs> is the bedrock of Muslim civilization and the main source of Islamic law and practice and you'll see page seven. That's all still introduction. Does all that make pretty much sense to everybody? Any questions? So that's question one. Question two, how do I become a Muslim? I thought that was an interesting question. I, I wrote all these questions. Um, and I wanted to read the answer, and it's page 390 in here. And it says, quote, one needs to make the following declaration. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except God. And by the way, you'll notice I got small g, capital G. Because I'm in a quotation, I did it exactly as it said quoted. Okay, I didn't change it. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. So you see the duality there. It's a dual belief. That is a belief in a monotheistic God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. That's page 390 in the Quran. Yes, sir? Well, how come it's mixed with Roman numerals and regular numbers? Well, because all the Roman numerals is the introduction. Oh, okay, okay. So Matt, that's, a, that's an excellent question, though. You know what? Let me just take a peek, and I'll tell you exactly how long the introduction is, because it's pretty long. The introduction is 26 pages. That's X, X, B, Y. 26 page introduction. This is why I like this particular copy, because this is a study Quran that gives um, um, paragraphs of explanation, just like the ESV. It gives footnotes, just like the ESV. And it also takes you back to other footnotes. Okay, uh, if I can see one real quick. I don't see one real quick. But, and some of these footnotes are, are pretty long. Okay. All right, so, that, that, does that help? Does everybody, is everybody with me? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question about Muhammad. Did they ever say about how he became... You know, his life and how he's a messenger and why it's Yeah, he couldn't it. read or write. He was illiterate. And that's what they say is the miracle of the transmission of the... Keith, you want to give both of them a copy of that? Yes, yeah, she has one. Give, give Vass one, great. Okay, hey Vass, oh. we're in question number two. And I just got back from Israel, and uh, I interacted with all of these uh, Muslim people and Jewish people over in the Holy Land, and I'm sharing a little bit of uh, reflections. And um, one reflection I have is uh, taking a um, look at Islam based on, and look up this way one more time. This is a new, and by the way, this is free. And I put the phone number on here. If you want a copy of this, check it out yourself. Call them up, say I'd like a copy, and they'll send it to you. This is a study Quran, which means they have footnotes written by a Muslim that explain the Quran text, just like your ESV study Bible. Isn't that cool? They've also got maps and, and all kinds of stuff in here. So, uh, and these yellow tabs in here, 
I read this in three days. There's 114 chapters, a little over 6,200 verses, and this is in English. I'm not reading Arabic. <laughs> okay, I didn't need to say that, but I thought that'd be funny. Okay, so we have the two questions so far. Any questions on the two questions? Okay, question three. What do Muslims practice? Now, the A stands for answer. It says, quote, Muslims follow the five pillars of Islam. Number one, testifying that there is only one God and Muhammad is his last prophet. Notice, last prophet. Number two, praying five times a day. Number three, fasting from dawn to sunset during the month of Ramadan. And you know that Ramadan is a Arabic holiday and it lasts about 10 days. And Ramadan is the name of an Arabic month. So why do they celebrate Ramadan? That answer will become evident as we go a little further. Hang on for that. Number four, paying alms tax. By the way, does everybody know what those three dots means? What's that called? Cedra. Cedra. Et cetera? Not exactly. Is it an ellipsis? It's an ellipsis, which means there's more words that I intentionally didn't include. And, and I can show you. It's paying alms tax, and then it goes on to say, if you can afford it, if you can't afford it, this, if you can't afford it, that. And in other words, it's, it's a long quote, and I shortened it. Okay? Paying alms tax. And number five, performing pilgrimage to Mecca, and again, you have the Saudi, you have the uh, ellipsis there, and that's page 15 in the introduction. Remember the introduction is how many pages? 26. 26 pages. Okay, so this is right out of their text. That, that's exactly what it says. Any questions about that? Do they have to just go one time to Mecca, or do they have to go more? They're supposed to go annually. Okay. I wasn't sure about that. But not everybody can, and this is where that ellipsis is, performing pilgrimage to Mecca. What, it, what they say is, if you're unable to go every year, if you're a good Muslim, you'll go at least one time in your lifetime. Okay, that's where I got the one time. Okay. But they like everybody to go every year. Okay? And everybody knows where Mecca is, right? No. no where is Mecca? Saudi Arabia. Okay. Oh. Okay, all right, so anyway, I gave you a note about Mecca, and this comes from Ancient Origins, and it's a website, and it says Mecca, also spelled as, and you see it, apart from the fact that Mecca was the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad, it is also the city where Islam's holiest place of worship, the Great Mosque, more commonly known as, and you see it there, is located. In addition, it is the direction of Mecca that Muslims face when they perform their five daily prayers. I have another question. You see the word five is in brackets? Why did I put it in brackets? Why is that, why is that like that? Why, why did I do that? Because they didn't. One person, one of them over there will put it. Important to them. What, what did you say? Go ahead. Important them. Uh, it is, but that's not the reason why I put it in. I put it in there. Why did I, why did I put it in brackets? Could there be more than five? More than five? No, because I put it in there. Yes, sir. Because they didn't have it in there, but you wanted to emphasize that it's five times because you know that. That's it. <laughs> they didn't say that. Remember, this is a quote. So if you're going to change a quote, You've got to alert your readers that you're changing the quote. So what I'm saying to you by putting it in brackets is, I have added that, okay, because I know that. Hmm. And they also said it previously. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got to be very careful what we do with quotations. And I'm trying to be very respectful here <coughs> and not uh, change anything. So that's what they practice, and that's what it is. Now, if you know anything about Muhammad, you know that he did not live his life in Mecca. He was born there, and that's the most holy place in Islam. That's what I asked you earlier about him. I mean, 
Uh, well, I wasn't ready done. to say it yet. That's why oh, I didn't okay. say it. I wanted to get it here because <laughs> it makes more sense because I'm talking about Mecca. Okay. Okay, I, I didn't want to get ahead of myself. Okay, so um, what happened is he immigrated to Medina, okay, which is another Saudi Arabian city. But Mecca is the site of the pilgrimage and the site of the great mosque. I can give you a, a weird side note on this, on the five, praying five times a day. When I went to South Africa, we went into Qatar, and they had notices on the plane, when you say your prayers, do it in your seat, do not kneel on the aisle. So, you know, I don't know how they know which way Mecca is when you're in a plane. They said, do it in your seat and not in the aisles. Yeah, don't get out in the aisles to do your daily prayer. Mm, interesting. I don't know why that is. Do you know? Because it would block the aisles. Yeah. That's oh, oh. Know. Well, hey, you know what? <laughs> when I flew El Al the first two times, you talk about blocking the aisles. This is the official Israeli Airlines, right? And do you know what El Al means? El Al, El is the name of God, and El is God, and Al is clouds or air. And it translates to God in the air or God in the clouds. Either is a correct translation. I've studied this. And um, these, these Orthodox Jews with these phylacteries and these prayer shawls, they would do their prayers walking and chanting up and down the aisles for 14 hours off and on. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was fascinating the first time I saw it because they'd get up and two or three of them would go up and, and they're bowing and chanting and this chant is a Hebrew chant. It's not a, you know, speaking in tongues or, you know, or just making noise. It's it's real language, you know, and uh, and they didn't do it from their seats. They only did it in the aisles, and that's interesting because that's the opposite of that. Well, it was the airline. Uh, we were on Qatar Airlines too, but they requested, they made an announcement: please do your prayers in your seat. Do not get in the aisles and. I get it. For okay. safety reasons. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense to me. Because yeah. it was a long, it was like a 13-hour flight, so they yeah. would have had several yeah. prayers during that. Yeah, very good. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, anything else? Any other questions so far? What do Muslims practice? Last, uh, fourthly, what do Muslims believe? Now, uh, this one says, quote, Muslims also believe in the six articles of faith, and this is a direct quote, Almighty God, His scriptures, His angels, free choice, fate and destiny, His prophets, and the day of judgment. Notice and is in a bracket because I added that for grammatical reasons, just to make it sound, you know, better. And that's on page 15. So that's that's what they state in the Quran that they believe. Does that make sense, Keith? So the free choice, that's the same as our free will? Um, <laughs> probably. <clears throat> let, me, let me think about that for a second. You know what? Let me turn to it and see if they have a footnote on it. That would be good. Because they have a footnote on a lot of these things. Let's see. That's a good question. No footnote on that. It, it says exactly as I, it's six things, free choice, fate, and destiny, that's one thing, that's one unit, um, and there's no footnote on that. But here's something that's not on your sheet. What is the fastest growing religion in the world? It might, it might be Christianity, I'm not sure. I wish it were. It's not? No, it's Muslim. Not according to some statistics I've seen. Catholics. It's Islam. Islam. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, totaling 1.6 billion 
Muslims make up one quarter of the world's population. Now that figure is is a little bit dated because this, this this date of this is 2016. Remember, I said it was a new new one. I didn't mean it was published in 2023 because it wasn't. I checked the publication date. It's 2016. It's the first edition in its 11th printing. So that figure is a little bit dated, and, and that's their figure. I wonder what George Barna would say. The, the reason I said that was I was, um, there's a professor that spoke here at a Bible conference four years ago before you, the Davinskys came here, and they, um, Dr. Tony Costa, and he has a, he did a, a, uh, a video on this where he was talking to as an apologist, and he said in the last couple of years, as the web increases its presence into Muslim areas and more people are watching uh, and reading about statistics and about different facts about Islam versus Christianity, um, it's amazing. They're, 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 not, they're losing steam right now because the arguments that their apologists make can't hold water compared to ours. Yeah. So, but that may be true, but it might be changing a little, so I don't know. Yeah. So the jury's out on that because we don't have uh, up-to-date statistics. But George Barna is a renowned statistician and a Christian. He's written many, many books, and I've read many of his books. And um, if any of you come across any literature, articles, or information by him on this subject, bring it to my attention. Let Pastor and I know that. Um, he's a credible source that I trust. I don't necessarily trust these figures because this is written by a Muslim in a Muslim book, and it might be, um, it might be a little bit of a hyperbole, uh, you know, little, or little, not. And I don't know that little bias opinion, maybe. Maybe could be. Um, that's why we need credible, unbiased uh, data when we do research. And and uh, George Bard is not the only one. Do you know? Anyone else that falls in that category? No, he's the guy I would have said to. He's the guy you would, you would mention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, okay, so this next section, now we're getting into the Bible. Does the Quran copy or agree with the Holy Bible? It might seem so because the Quran mentions several people in the Bible. For example, John the Baptist, Mary and Jesus, page 31, as well as several Old Testament people like Adam, Noah, Joseph, Jacob, Jonah, Moses, Abraham, Hagar, and Ishmael. And I have the pagination for all of those, and I have them all marked in here. So some people have told me in the past, well, the Quran copies the Bible. So I'm asking the question, does it or does it not? And um, I'm leaving that open for the minute until I go a little further. Okay, so follow with me. However, the Quran is quite different from the Holy Bible. For example, it's believed that the angel, Gabriel, delivered it to the prophet, Mohammed, which it says that on page 354, on, quote, the night of Ramadan, 27, 610 CE AD. Now, so that goes back to what we were talking about before, about the month of Ramadan. So the reason they have these Arabic holy days uh, or celebrations during Ramadan is to celebrate the giving of the Quran to Muhammad on the 27th night of Ramadan. So Ramadan is the month. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is everybody with me? Yes. Okay, now i got another question for you. Notice it says 610 CE. What is CE? What, is, what does that mean? I'm just going to ask you. <laughs> What's CE? Christian what? error. No. What is it? Christian error. Common error. Common, error. Common, error. Common, error. common error. Common error. She's right. Uh huh. Common error. And notice I put in the quote in a bracket AD. Why did I do that? Anno Domini, year, year of our Lord. <laughs> Anno Domini, Latin in the year of our Lord. And so 
They used BCE <laughs> for before Christ and, and CE for AD. And so that's not only common in Muslim writings, but that's common in all secular writings. I've seen that many, many, many places. Okay? Uh, and Gabriel is identified as the Holy Spirit. Now, I read that and I'm like, what? You just said he was an angel. Now you say he's the Holy Spirit. So I'm confused. So I'm going to let you judge that because I'm going to read it to you. Hang on, give me a second. Okay. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here because that this comes out. Let me hold off on that. Let me come back to that Holy Spirit later because it goes into something else. Furthermore, Jesus as God the Son and Messiah is fervently denied. The Quran says, quote, the Christians say, quote, the Messiah is the Son of God, end quote. Such are the baseless assertions only parroting the words of earlier disbelievers. May God condemn them. How can they be deluded from the truth? End quote. That's what the Muslims are saying about you and me. That's what the Muslims are saying about us. Does that make sense? So you see, the Quran and the Holy Bible are worlds apart and vastly different. So let's go back to that Holy Spirit for a minute. And um, you be the judge. I'm going to read this. Whoops. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of God in the fulfillment of his word through Mary and a spirit created by a command from him. Footnote 232, i.e., Jesus was created by God's word, be, and he was, and life was breathed into Jesus by the Holy Spirit, parentheses, the angel Gabriel, and the parentheses, and the command of God. So they're identifying Gabriel first as an angel. Now they're identifying Gabriel as the Holy Spirit. And you know, that is so blasphemous because the Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune Godhead, the third person right. of our right. Trinity. And... Um, the Bible has a lot to say about the, the Holy Spirit. And here, uh, they're equating the Holy Spirit with a messenger, with an angel, with Gabriel. Do you see that? And that comes right out of their text. Okay. All right. Lastly, the Quran vehemently denies the Trinity. And I just read that. It says, Mary... It says, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of God and the fulfillment of his word through Mary and a spirit created by a command from him. So believe in God and his messengers and do not say Trinity. Stop for your own good. End quote. That's, that's right, right out of here. That, that's a direct quote from what they say. Wow. Wow. So, Vass, you didn't hear the introduction to this message, so I'm going to do it just for you and Kayla and everybody else, just in case you forgot. I started off this lecture or this Bible study saying that my trip to the Holy Land, my third tour of the Holy Land, was both a tremendous blessing and a terrible, terrible disappointment. It was a blessing because I got to sail across the Sea of Galilee where my Lord did as well. I got to walk or ride in a golf cart, the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows that Jesus walked. I served Holy Communion to 11 people in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I baptized nine in the Jordan River. Blessing, blessing, blessing. Very fulfilling, very purposeful but still a great disappointment. 
And the disappointment is because I was in a sea of people and in a universe, a world of unbelief. Because the Jews don't accept Jesus as the Messiah, and the Muslims see Jesus as a mere messenger and not Almighty God. And so here we have the Holy Land with a sea of people who are lost in their sin. That's the disappointment. <clears throat> Let me talk about Jerusalem for a minute. See Jerusalem on my shirt? Pam's got it on her shirt. How many of you know about Washington, D.C. broken down into four quarters? Are you familiar with that? How many of you know that? Raise your hand. Three of you, four of you? You all don't know that? Okay. So draw Washington, D.C. on a chalkboard. Make out I did that. Draw crosshairs just like a scope, okay? And it's broke down by direction. There is northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast. So if you live on Pennsylvania Avenue, which is the avenue of the White House, you're going to be at 123 Pennsylvania Avenue, southwest or northwest, depending on where you are, or 123, Main, 123 Pennsylvania Avenue, north, uh, east or southeast, because it runs uh, horizontal this way. And so everybody's address in D.C. has a designation of northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. Is that correct? I don't know that. But yes, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I went to Washington Bible College in the district, so it is correct. Yeah. Trust me on that. Unless they changed it, like they changed Pluto not being a planet anymore. <laughs> And that's true. I wasn't lying to you. <laughs> no, you were not. You shot the socks off of me. I looked over at Pam when he said he said that in the sermon. He said, Pluto's not a planet. And I have a hearing problem. So I looked over at Pam. I said, Pam, did he say Pluto's not a planet? She said, that's what he said. So I wrote it down, went home, looked it up. And sure enough, it was reclassified. It's not a planet. So maybe they changed D.C. But when I went there, it was four quadrants. Well, that's exactly how Jerusalem is. <clears throat> Jerusalem has four quadrants, four sections. Do you know what the four sections are? No. They are Muslim, Jewish, Christian, and Armenian. Now, I did them in a different order. They're not in that order. And um, in uh, my, my tour, I was into all four quarters. And eventually, I have pictures to show and, you know, I hope to do a presentation. All of us hope to do a presentation eventually. And you'll be able to see um, um, the Armenian church in the Armenian quarter. You'll be able to see a large uh, three-by-five-foot menu, wooden board menu of the Armenian restaurant. And then you'll see other pictures that will have have the Muslim menu for their, their restaurants. So it's really four distinct neighborhoods, and they're very, very distinct. Okay? So, um, and that's how Washington is set up. Well, who are the Palestinians? Remember how they were always talking about them and forget who the leader was at the time? And the Palestinians are a group of people um, who have lived in Palestine, which it was called at one time for hundreds, if not thousands of years, okay? Uh, we went to Bethlehem. Uh, do you know who controls Bethlehem? The Palestinians. The Palestinians. At least they get over there. Okay, good. And yeah. you know the capital of Palestine? It's Ramallah, okay? Ramallah is the official capital of the state of Palestine. Now, I didn't make this up. This was on this presentation that I watched before I went over. I mentioned this two or three times now, um, a two-hour presentation on Israel. And um, Bethlehem is under Palestinian rule. So our tour guide is an Israeli, and her name is Vered, like very red, very red. Put them together, and it's Vered, V-R-E-D. 
Vered in Hebrew means rose, and she works for a company called Vered Hasharon. Hasharon means rose of Sharon. So Vered Hasharon is rose of Sharon. And um, I have that. I have hats. You'll you'll see when you see the pictures. You'll see us all wearing baseball caps with Vered Hasharon on the hat. That's the that's the travel company. Um, so anyway. Uh, Vered uh, and our driver, who was Ali, and they're both Israelis, they took us to the, to the line, to the border, and handed us off to um, George. <laughs> I asked him his name. He's a Palestinian, real nice guy, great guy. And uh, I said, what is your name? And I'm expecting a Palestinian <coughs> name. He said, I'm George. <laughs> Great, you're thinking, yeah. <laughs> I started to laugh, and I had to catch myself. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. I said, I'm sorry I'm laughing, but I didn't expect George. He said, that's all right. Everybody does it. <laughs> was that his real given name? I doubt it. I was going to say. I seriously doubt it. But he didn't say what his given name was. He, he just said, I'm George. I said, okay, George. So we called him George. He was a great, great tour guide. Um, and uh, he gave me a little insight into the tension that's going on with uh, what's going on over there. While we were driving, you know, we are in a 15-passenger air-conditioned van, and as the tour host, I'm sitting right up front with George and, and the driver. And so I'm talking to George as we're driving, and I said, can you tell me... Uh, oh, he took us to a, Bethle a restaurant in Bethlehem, and I had an official Palestinian dinner, and it was delicious. We had chicken and rice and, and all kinds of stuff. It was really good. And uh, I said to George, I said, can you tell me how far Bethlehem is from Ramallah? Well, as soon as I said Ramallah, his eyes went bing! You know, I noticed his expression change. He said, well, it's not far. So he didn't tell me. I said, oh. I said, the reason I asked is because as a tour host, Floyd came over here. So I told him about this series I watched. And I said, I learned in the series that Ramallah is the official capital of the state of Palestine. Well, I made a mistake. <laughs> that didn't sit real well with him. George popped a cork, huh? I did. <laughs> I did. I put my foot in my mouth, and he looked at me and he said, Jerusalem is our capital! Jerusalem! Just like that. And I said, okay, George, okay. <laughs> but in the series, it said that. And I told him that. I said, well, in this series, and I told him who it was, and he knew, he knew the series. He said, well, the reason they do that is because that's where the administrative buildings are for the state of Palestine. He said the administrative buildings for the state of Palestine are in Ramallah, but Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. I said, okay, George, okay. Uh, I wasn't going to debate it, you know. I mean, that wasn't the whole purpose anyway. But uh, sorry about that. Jerusalem is their capital. But uh, if you look it up in Encyclopedia Britannica or whatever, you'll see Ramallah. And that is in the West Bank. Now, I saw something in Israel I had not seen in the two previous times. And in 2002, they started to build a wall between the Israeli settlements and the Palestinian towns. And the Israelis call it, quote, the separation wall. And I have pictures of all of this, and, um, and it's a brick, big, oh, it's got to be eight, ten feet tall. It's got, you know, barbed wire at the top. And I got pictures of this, and uh, the Palestinians hate it. They don't call it the separation wall. They call it the prison wall, because mm -hmm. they told me that. I asked that. And I took a picture of the wall, and we stopped there 
We were driving along, and I said to the Palestinian driver, I said, can you stop? He hit the brakes, stopped the vehicle <laughs> in the middle of traffic. I said, can I take a picture? He said, okay. I jumped out of this thing, ran across the street, took his picture, and the crazy Americans. <laughs> and what it is, is it's the wall, and it's going down, and then it curves, and then there is a hotel there, and you'll never guess the name of it. It's very famous, by the way. I didn't know it was famous. Holiday Inn. <laughs> what is it? Holiday Inn. No. Holiday Inn, is that what you said? Yeah. No, it's called the Walled Out Hotel. Because the wall goes around and it's across the street. The Walled Out Hotel. I just thought that was cute, but I didn't know it was famous. But it is, at least to them. So what does our Heavenly Father want us to do? we got to get to the heart of the matter, and this is the heart. What does the Heavenly Father want us to do? We've learned about the Quran. We've learned about Muslims. We've learned about what they practice, what they believe. We've learned that the Quran is vastly different than the Holy Bible. And what does God want us to do? He wants us to believe in and trust the verbal, plenary, divine inspiration of the 66 books of the Holy Bible and learn them from cover to cover. By the way, you ESV study Bible people, there is in your Bibles, uh, and I have one right here, I'm not turning to it, but there's a section in here on how the canon of scripture was formed and mm -hmm. how the 66 books were chosen, and it's really, really good. So if you take the time and look in the back, you'll find <clears> that. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Can somebody quote that or do we need to read it? All scripture is... God breathed and useful for preaching, teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness, something like that. Or, so that the man of God, God may be, be fully equipped for every good work. I think. Equipped for every good work. Something okay, like good. That. I like that. So my point that I'm making here is you not only need to believe it, you not only need to trust it, you need to learn this book from cover to cover. And I believe that the reason the American Christian church is as weak as it is, and I think it's very weak, is because the American Christians as a whole, unfortunately, I'm ashamed to admit it, don't know the Bible. Okay? People know bits and pieces, but they've never read it cover to cover. My daughter-in-law is from the Philippines, and uh, her English is very broken, but she's reading the English Bible cover to cover right now, and she's, uh, she's overwhelmed and struggling in the book of Numbers, and I told her, just keep reading, keep reading, just get the, get the main point, and if you have questions, we'll come back, because she, she asks me questions every now and then, but every once in a while she asks me a question that takes a lot to answer, it's not yes and no, but uh, we, we really need to know the Word of God. If you do, then you will be prepared to identify, define, and expose false teachings and not be deceived by Satan or his followers. If you're not spiritually prepared, then you are an easy mark for the deceiver. Ladies and gentlemen, you're a sitting duck if you don't know the Word of God. Seriously. And I am, you are, we are, your kids, my kids, your grandkids, my grandkids, everybody's grandkids. We need to know the Word of God. We need to be prepared in order to know how to identify, define, and expose false teaching. And um, one of um, our people, Arshad, was my roommate in... in uh, in this trip, and we uh, bunked together for 10 days, and he told me that the Muslims in Pakistan are stupid. His word, his word. And the reason he said that is because they believe the Quran, and they don't know what they're believing, and they don't investigate it, they just read it and believe it, and, and, and that's it. He said that is so stupid. We, him and I prayed together. Have you ever prayed in two languages? It's not easy, yeah. <laughs> Him and I did. He doesn't pray in English most of the time. He prays in Urdu. Mm -hmm. So he prayed in Urdu, and then I prayed in English. 
And we did this every night for, for 10 nights, and it was a real spiritual time and some real spiritual interactions. And, and if you know Arshad, he has about 100 questions. <clears throat> and uh, we talked about the Bible back and forth, and it was really, really great. But he's a converted Muslim, and uh, Pakistan is a Muslim. Oh, really? He, he was originally from out of, really, he came out of Islam. I, th I think so. Oh, I okay. believe so. But hmm. I need to double check that with him. But Pakistan is a Muslim country, and, and, and Pakistan is one of the few countries around the world that does not accept Israel as a state. Okay? This is why he was a little concerned about getting into Israel, because he has... An American passport, but he has a Pakistani stamp because he went back to visit his family, and so there, there's tension there. But Pakistan is a is a thoroughly Muslim country, and he's a converted uh, man of God. And uh, let remember, Jesus said, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me." John fourteen six. And Luke clarifies, Doctor Luke. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name <clears throat> under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Thus, let's learn and let's live the word of God together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Two weeks in Bible study. Next week is Holy Week. We do not have Wednesday night. We do have Thursday night at 7 o'clock, Monday, Thursday. Do you want to say a word about that? Um, there will be, it'll be in the sanctuary. There will be feet washing and uh, Lord's Supper. And the theme is Amazing Grace because this is the 250th anniversary of the authorship of that wonderful hymn. And you're going to learn some history about it. And it might surprise you. I just read that. Was that in the Sunshine News? Yes. That's where I read it. I just read that. I was like, I just read that. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good night. Craig, did you know there's a new